Thank okay. you very much for hosting this. I'm a big fan. As I said, I really dug your Ryan Roxy video because uh, thank you. I remember his band Candy. So yes, thank you so much. And we were talking about Candy before. So was Candy like one of your favorites? Like, what kind of music did you listen to? Well, um, back then, um, I listened to a lot of um, the Los Angeles um, punk rock stuff, like the Germs, the Brat. Um, uh, um, uh, the Weird Out, the Dickies, uh, X, the Blasters, the Go Go's, um, wow. Los Angeles punk scene in the early 80s, very, very early 80s. Um, Social Distortion, TSOL, Eddie and the Subtitles, a whole bunch of them. Um, and because I was going out a lot, I was very young. Um, we just knew kind of what bands were popular, when they were popular, um, and Candy was a very, very popular band. Um, and they were very, very good at what they did. They kind of had this like Bay City Rollers kind of thing, and I don't know if you, um, if anyone remembers the Bay City Rollers, but uh, the DeFranco family, it was bizarre. But anyway, they were very, very good at what they did, kind of a power pop thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, all those bands that you just named are so great. And I feel like, would you say you had like, like you were into a lot of different genres of music, like growing up? No. Um, no? The, the real truth is um, I got into skateboarding very, very young and the older guys, uh, like Dwayne Peters and um, some of the older guys got into punk and they wouldn't allow you if you were a young grommet to skate the pools unless you cut your hair and dyed it and they charge you. That's true. And they charged you to actually cut the hair and, and dye it. And I didn't know, like, I, I knew I liked music, but I was more interested in skateboarding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when the older guys got into punk rock, we naturally kind of gravitated to it. Um, there was a, there was a skate park called uh, Marina Del Rey skate park that um, actually had bands play at the skate park. One of the early, early bands was social distortion. Mm -hmm. Very early on, very, very early on. Um, and um, I just started getting feverish with music. The, the honest truth is the first music I got into was punk rock. The, um, uh, my first record was um, Beach Boulevard. Um, uh, uh, m one of my first concerts was like 999 at the Dickies at the Santa Monica Civic. And then afterwards in the mid eighties, when there was like this kind of hair metal thing, I, I wasn't, I wasn't quite cued into, I went back, I went back and I listened to, um, folk music and, and the, and the, the Beatles, the Stones, David Bowie, the Who, um, Chuck Berry, excuse me, Little Richard, um, Elvis, and I really kind of went back for a number of years. Um, but the truth is, my first love of music came from punk rock. Wow. So for a while, it was strictly punk rock, and then you slowly started to branch out and like. Yes. As I, I got older, and the music scene was not something I kind of related to, I just went back. I mean, I, I remember listening to the Aftermath record um, literally hundreds of times, hundreds of times, mm -hmm. or the White Album, or um, my, my favorite David Bowie record. Uh, by the way, because I know you're a kind of a classic rock chick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, my favorite Bowie record is Low, and I know that's an odd kind of favorite Bowie record. Do you have a favorite Bowie record? It's hard because... I don't know if I'd say, like, that's hard. I've never thought about, like, my favorite because it's, like, he's had so many different eras. Like, each persona he created was so different. But, I mean, I fell in love with Bowie when I first saw Labyrinth. Um, oh, wow. 
and that's when I was like, oh my God, like I loved the Labyrinth soundtrack. Like for a long time, that was my favorite. Oh, <laughs> so that, that kind of drama and kind of expansive kind of musical stuff. That's interesting. It was very like cinematic and magical to me because I saw it when I was really young and that's like what made me love him. So when I listen to it now, it feels very um, like Familiar. nostalgic and yes. Really yeah. cool. Yeah, that's cool though. You're a Bowie fan. I mean, Bowie's the best. Bowie's the man. <laughs> so I also read that when you were around 15, uh -oh. is when you started doing music, is that true? Yes, 15, 15. Yeah, we, we had a, a band that played at parties, you know, like in high school. I, I was in 10th grade or 11th grade, I think. 11th grade, I don't know, 11th grade, 10th grade, something like that. <laughs> and we would play parties um, in a band called The Resistance. And um, we never we never played instruments. None of us played instruments. We just played. And it was just a bunch of us kids who were skaters we just started playing music, you know, literally started playing music. I played the guitar, wrote some songs. Eric Troop um, uh, did um, bass. There's a guy, his name is Kerry Duran, who played drums. Jim Lane uh, <laughs> sang and I mean, 15 year old and we were playing parties. And, you know, back then there were the punk scene was violent. I mean, the truth is it was, it was, so every time we played, there would be a fight against the punks and the jocks every single time, like fights. Um, yeah. Much different now because punk rock is perhaps a bit more accepted or a bit more understood. But back then we had blue hair and, you know, it was very different. But, um, but the interesting thing was um, a, a really uh, what I like to call, I have the disease and the disease is music. It's not something that um, I have any control of. Mm -hmm. when, I, when I went to college, I, I thought I'd do something different, but I couldn't get away from music. And I think Alexa, mm -hmm. a little bit of the disease in you, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Definitely, ever since I was really young. I mean, I've made music. I've always loved music. Um, I would. I was making music pretty young too. But I, I, I know what you mean. And yes, <laughs> in that sense, yeah, I do. Now, a question: Have you tried to do things other than radio stuff, DJ stuff, um, blog stuff in regards to music? I mean, did you try to? I don't know. Do something else, but kind of always came back to music yeah that's like really funny you said that because originally i think i mean i've always wanted to do music and then i think as i got older i was like i still love it and i still do it like growing up i tried out for like voice like x factor like those shows like i used to travel to like philadelphia and washington for those shows um i like would do covers with my friends. I started playing bass a little bit um, and it was always there. But I think as I got older, I said, okay, like, you know, I love radio too and I love writing so I could do both, find a way to do both, you know? I can write about music and I can play music and, you know, interview musicians and artists while also still being able to do music and be in that realm. I get it. I get it more than you, more than you know. Yeah. <laughs> So you've always, like, it's always been there for you. So did you always know, like, I need to do music. I need to do something with music or be in that realm. No, I mean, I, I literally, I went to college. I thought I'd get into research, something in, in research. I was, uh, I put myself through college, but college was very difficult because um, I, I never, it never was easy for me. I got in, I, you know, I worked very hard, but I never should have gone to college because it was too difficult for me. Um, but I always found myself going out to see shows, putting on benefit shows. I was going out to see music more than I was studying. Um, and that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. No, I know. Um, so um, I tried, I tried my best to not do music, but 
I was just doing it. Like people ask me a lot of times, you know, how do you get into the music business? And I say, just do it. I know that sounds trite or cliched, but whatever you do, just do it. If you want to do a music blog, do a music blog. Like if you want to do journalism, do journalism. If you want to do what I do, A&R or talent scout or production, just do it. Like no one's stopping you. That's the beauty. That's the, it's the most, it's like the wild west. Anything is possible. And there's something really rock and roll about that anyway, you know? Um, so I thought, I mean, listen, I, I thought I could do something else, but I can't, it's not, I don't know. I don't know how to do anything else. And this further, is what you're meant to do. Yes. And I'm, I'm grateful, grateful that I found something I'm meant to do and I'm continuing to get better and better at it. And I enjoy being excellent at it. You see, the only way you get really good at something is if you enjoy the process, if you enjoy the obstacles, if you enjoy the failures. So I enjoy it, um, which, which gives me an idea that I actually am, I, I'm okay at doing it. In other words, when you don't enjoy something you do every day, perhaps that's not something you should be doing. Absolutely. You got to love what you do because then, you know, like that's saying, like you'll never work a day in your life if you love what you're doing truly, you know, 100%. it's true. So for you, when did you decide it was like producing? Like when did you just get into that? Good question. Um, I was, uh, I got an internship at Capitol records and I, I begged the, the guy who gave me the internship for like nine months begged him, begged, begged. I mean, I said, please let me work for free. I mean, it was kind of at the time. So as soon as I got that, that internship, I said, okay, I was working at the surf shop. I was teaching surfing. I was working as a bartender at a roller disco in South central Los Angeles. That's another crazy story. Um, I was hustling. Like I was doing all sorts of things. And I said, in order to do a and r really well i have to be able to communicate the artist which is the voice the repertoire which is the songs and i felt as though the best way of learning how to do that like i told you is to just do it through production the first artist i ever produced we were lucky enough to get her a, ma a big time management deal and a big time um uh, uh, publishing deal and I told her her name is Pippi Bernstein and she's fabulous I mean she's just a sweet wonderful interesting human being but I remember saying to her listen I'd like to produce your music if you don't like it I'll give you the tapes and you can burn them and if you do like it and if you do like it I'll put it out on my set on my singles label called lifelong life I had a, a little label at the time I developed because I told her I would put it out. We put it out on Lifelong Life Records and she did really well. Um, and then from there, that's all I did was produce, develop, um, utilize all the things I do now that I've been doing for 20, 25 years. Um, but that's how I got into it. I thought that doing well at a record company like Capital or Atlantic or Sony or whatever, is learning how to help an artist, truly help an artist have number one hits. What I didn't learn is that that's not, that's not what that job really means. <laughs> and that's a whole other can of worms, but that's, that's what I did. Interesting. So it was never like, I have a plan to produce music. Was it kind of just like you got the internship and from there realized like, Oh, this would be a good thing. Yes. Very interesting. And how was your internship at Capitol? That's amazing. Three, I'm sure it must've been great. Like internship. Three, three years. Internship. Yeah. I did it for a long time. Um, and I, I then from the internship, I got a, a consultancy from the consultancy. I got, um, a low level uh, a and r job a director 's a and r job and then um, then um, I got let go back to a consultancy and then 
we made the Jimmy World record, and then the new president, the new president hired me as a VP. Um, so, to make a long story short, I learned over those fifteen or so years a tremendous amount about the culture of selling records and or selling streams or building a brand or whatever you want to call it in 2020. I also learned what 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 I'm good at. I learned what I'm not good at, um, but it was a tremendous experience. I mean, I'm lucky as shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, of course. And you actually, you mentioned Jimmy Eat World, and that was gonna be my next question. So you worked with Jimmy Eat World, Plain White Tees, Neon Trees, which are pretty big names. So how was that? Um, they, they all had number one songs. Yeah. Just recently, I executive produced a band called The Unlikely Candidates, who have a number one song with a song called Novocaine, literally March 2020. Um, it's what I do. You know, I help artists understand that the music business, if you want to get into the music business, it's not a mystery. It's not mysterious. There is a a, a skill set. There is a discipline that you can learn or become interested in and implement that will help you not only be successful, but be able to repeat your success. So, I, I you know, there's a reason why all of the, the artists you mentioned have repeated their success because they've learned, hopefully, from me about some of the um, elements. That's that are necessary in order to repeat that success. So, what are some of those like elements? Being prolific. In other words, when I say prolific, let me make it perfectly clear. I think you've got to be able to write at least one or two songs a week, full songs. Um, two, being a disciplined songwriter. Now that's an interesting concept. What does a disciplined songwriter mean? A disciplined songwriter means you must understand structure, rhythm, chord progression, lyrics, especially lyrics, and understand why those elements are popular in the in the in the um, popular music scene. In other words. What I, I like to call it the Lauren Israel Manifesto. Use four chords, make the song up tempo, have two hooks in the in the chorus, make the make the lyrics conversational with a bunch of poetic devices. Make sure it's uh, make sure that the verse is rather linear with some space and lift the chorus. And if you do that a hundred times, if you do it. 200 times you'll eventually find a song that that is the nucleus of your success it sounds simplistic it sounds blasphemous it sounds completely you know cheesy if you will or maybe not but the truth is if you are a student of success in the music business that's what's been happening since the 50s. Interesting. So there's like a formula almost to that. If I, if I called it a formula, I'd be getting hate mail. I don't like <laughs> to call it a formula. I like to call it an understanding, okay. a, a discipline, um, because our brains have been, have been manipulated, not manipulated, have been forced to hear a song from the 50s on the modalities of, 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 uh, of media, radio, television, movies. Mm -hmm. And frankly, when you hear a song on the radio, all the number one songs have the same elements. Exactly, yes. They do. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. If you wanna call it, call it whatever you want. But if you, if, you, if you can find artistry within the discipline, there's no doubt you can be successful. And repeat your success. 
I got it. Interesting. Very interesting to think about and like hear about like what goes into it and like the mindset behind it. But my question is, I was wondering if you can work with any artist ever and produce one of their records, who would it be? Well, that's a great question. Does it have to be a current artist? No, it could be anyone, any artist. I'd like to work with Oliver Tree. Interesting. Why? I think he's bitching. <laughs> yeah. The perfect reason, because <laughs> he's bitching. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Very cool. And my last question would be for anybody in the realm of entertainment, music business, do you have one really good solid piece of advice for them who's trying to like break their way into the industry? Look for help and ask for it. There are, if, if, you, if there's a famous producer you want to, you want to um, get a hold of, you know, hit him up on the social media, find his or her email address and say, hey, um, can you help me? And do whatever that person says. That's really the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know about acting or I don't know about other modalities, but the music industry is the most wonderful industry because it's truly, truly maverick. You have all sorts of people who are trying to do all sorts of wonderful things. And I need people like you and you need people like me. So there's no shame in asking someone for help. Always ask for help. Always. Don't be bashful because you don't know. You don't know something that somebody else knows. If I asked you, Alexa, about certain things about what you do best, you would tell me. You'd say, hey, that this is how I do it. And I the same to you. Um, and granted, um, your time is valuable. My time is valuable. So maybe you say, hey, can I take you out for a burrito? Or can I postmate? <laughs> can I postmate some chicken chow mein to your house and can you give me 10 minutes of your time? Like, cool, that's cool. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but you gotta do that. You gotta find people who are better than you, who've done it longer. Listen, how does, how does a plumber really learn how to be a plumber? I ask for help. He asks another plumber who's been doing it for longer that's than he has. Yeah. Right. How does a lawyer become a great lawyer? by doing law, by going to a firm and asking for the firm's help in terms of doing law. That's why they call it a practice, a medical doctor, a practice. If you wanna put in a, a window in a house, how are you gonna learn how to do that? You're gonna follow someone else's example. Why, oh why, oh why, do people in the music business think it's, it's this divine intervention? Like I'm, I'm suddenly gonna write a hit song. It does not happen. It's purposeful. Life is purposeful. That's why I call it more being disciplined rather than being following kind of a, a formula. Just be disciplined. Awesome. I think that's great advice. And I agree. And, and it's like, you know, if you don't ask for help, how are you going to get help? You know, how are you going to learn? You got to put yourself out there. And that's a great piece of advice. So thank you. And thank you so much for taking the time to be here and do this with me.